All right, good morning. We're here with Nick Lorenz again, a retired firefighter and a friend of Blue Pads now, and he can't get rid of me. So we're, <laughs> we're doing this third part, which uh, the first two parts were just, you know, astounding in terms of the knowledge that you have, Nick, from a practical experience, as well as the life experience that you bring on the job and off the job to share with people so that way we could help save lives. Uh, that is the goal of this entire thing is how do we try to connect with people, uh, whether they be any, any breed or first responder, so that way they could have some level of hope that uh, just keep going, don't give up, don't give up. So, um, so uh, thank you for being here, Nick. And uh, I wanna maximize on your time and less on mine. So I'll turn it over to you. I like when you're talking a lot more. Uh, thank, thanks, Doc. Good morning. Yeah, I had such a, um, that, that was such a great experience to share with you. I didn't know what to expect. Um, but, but we wanted to uh, kind of dive into more what we're talking about here and PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder, disease, illness, injury. I know we, everyone wants to modify the right word, the right way of looking at it. But in that attempt to do that, what we're trying to do is understand it. And shell shock, you know, 70, 90 years ago, th this word has transformed in the last century. Um, but there's no, there's no uh, denying that, that, that what it is is real um, and that it will affect <laughs> everyone under no prejudice, um, and that's not something that uh, I, I thought was the case. So the reason, uh, how we define mental health conditions, and by we, I should, I, I'll speak for myself. Having served in the military as a young man, that is a culture for four years where I developed a, um, a can-do, adapt and overcome attitude. And so in talking to the kids, like any experience in life, it's what you make of it. And I made a lot of it. But I also gained some, some poor perceptions of what I thought things were based on a culture of, of hardened warriors uh, that, that I didn't transition in the fire service. They parallel each other, um, public safety in the military. So my, my uh, thought of going into the fire service, and if someone were to have mentioned those four letters, PTSD, I would have said, and I can recall so clearly throughout my career, going that, how could this job give someone PTSD? You would know that right away. Um, I, I, I prided myself on being calm, but, but we'll get to that in a minute on, on intense calls, because what you realize is you're hiding. You're, 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 it's, it's such a powerful front that you can only carry that on for so long. So my, my, what I thought of when I considered those four letters that I struggled with forever to even admit that I was diagnosed with, I, I later found out the denial of di diagnosis because I could be sick and injured, not well, but do not slap that label on me. I, I'm, I'm anti-labels. I don't like being put in a box. So even with religion and politics, I just, you know, don't, don't put me over there. Don't put me here. And so with PTSD, I didn't like that either. And, and throughout my, my 20 years in public safety, when we would hear about a member or even an associate, a, a peer, not necessarily in the fire, fire department, Scottsdale, but maybe a partner of ours, was suffering from some mental health issues, it was very private, uh, understandably so. It was very concealed. It was like a top secret thing. So you reach out to these members. None of us know what to say. None of us know what's going on. Um, you don't know anything. And so, so you're left for a little mystery and what if, and, and I seem fine. I'm excelling. I'm functioning. You know, you know, I had all the bullet points and I think a lot of us firefighters and police officers do is 
you you evaluate your resume or your accomplishments and suppress that that, that I'm not an alcoholic. I, I, I'm a I'm successful. I'm not struggling with anxiety and depression. I'm I'm working hard. So again, it's how we look at these things internally that are that are screaming at us. I had uh, I remember being diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Okay, some ulcers from stress, um, and then the doc maybe genetics. Um, so it had to do with the combination of what I was eating, the, the alcohol I was drinking, and the amount of stress I was under. Uh, all sort of colitis is a thing in the past, but that was a sign. Not sleeping, um, anxiety. Yeah, you have general anxiety disorder. You know, you, you get red flag after red flag if you're like me pursuing some, hey, I'm not quite right. But for the average run of the mill person that's kind of ho humming along, maybe is an alcoholic, maybe is more of a even keel person, there's still a, a fear of talking about this. So it's still very present and, and cut me off at any time, Doc, but I received a well, call. I, I do want to ask you a question about that because you know it's been my experience, Nick, and you tell me if you think this is true, that when guys do come forward and say something, other guys judge them or gals judge them as being weak. And they say, well, you know, I've been on those same calls and I don't have any issues. So why does that person have issues? You know, they're just weak. They probably shouldn't be, you know, right in with us because, you know, they can't handle those types of calls. Uh, did you ever get judged like that? Or have you ever heard that? Because I have. Yeah. Have I heard it? Absolutely. Did I do it myself? Yep. Yep. Right. And, yep. you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, we had a suicide, well, we've had many suicides, but we had a suicide a year and a half ago um, and of a firefighter. And he was a, a guy that was adamant in saying that when people died by suicide, they were weak. He never understood it. He said, you know, I don't get it. And, uh, and I don't know why anybody would do that to their family, but yet still he did it. Uh, and, and it was a huge, a ginormous shock to everybody. You've been on that road before where you felt, you know, probably similarly, but yet still you were also on a suicide road as well, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that was right before I decided that, that hey, I, I need to maybe take some action. You know, it's one thing to be an alcoholic. It's one thing to, to have areas of your life that you struggle in. We call that being human. So when I realized that I had everything that I had ever dreamed of, and I, what I mean, I dreamed of, I didn't dream for mansions and sports cars. I dreamed of a, a, a loving, supportive wife that valued the same things I did, but, but was keeping me accountable. So I, I had the check marks, I, everything. Boy, it was like, I don't understand. So I didn't put myself in that category of potential people that could be suffering from PTSD. But when you just, you brought, I'm, I'm glad you cut me off because, or not cut me off, I'm glad you interjected there, Doc, because that what I was about to say is the call I just had with a gentleman who's still actively on, who is, is, is a good friend, was a partner and good friend when I was working. And yeah, you know, they're at a point where they, hey, I am, here's what I'm doing about my PTSD. I mean, what a, what a wonderful thing to hear. And here's how it's gone culturally. And, 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 and by no means people, wherever you're at or whoever finds this video, no way, no shape, no form. Am I criticizing a city or municipal fire department? No way. We, we uh, all scratch our heads at how to help serve our, our members when they're going through physical and mental injuries and mental are just sometimes more private and less understandable. So when we, when, when I, I believe the biggest for me and, and from the dozens of people I've talked to now, there's a lot at stake when you ask for help, there's a lot at stake and, and mainly it's internal. It's how you think people will see you. Will this uh, hurt a promotion. If you're even thinking rationally like that, um, you know, you're way ahead of where I was at. I didn't think of those things because I did not, would not, could not have PTSD. I was a special forces Marine. The only people who get that are the guys you see, the amputees, 
-hmm. and the guy on the movie with a scar and, and I were I served with some of those guys they can have it but the mom who got in a car wreck and eh, uh, uh, the 10 year old verbally physically come on seriously you don't have it um so it was a very sacred thing to me that only the hardened warriors who have been through the most horrific combat combat of hell could that okay now i can understand how you have ptsd and those thoughts those internal conversations we helped a gentleman while i was on the department was helping this guy with ptsd reintegrate he's a success story because he's still on the job um I mean, they're all success stories. You know, I'm alive, right? We can talk about that and how suicide will slowly keep in, creep in. But I remember this gentleman leaving and our crew turning around, walking inside going, I don't get it. We've run those calls a thousand times. I don't get it. How could anyone be struggling with this? And then to carry it on is, hey, they say 5%, you know? We gotta cut out. We gotta cut out those that that can't keep pushing forward. Um, so, you know, I I had said, thought, and fantasized every incorrect way of looking at PTSD. And so, for me, when I looked back, when I was diagnosed, started treatment, was in that suicidal state, and I want to talk about that. How you can have everything. And even say things like the, the gentleman that took his own life said, and I, I believe a lot of people who do take their own life are those people. Mm -hmm. And I was certainly on my way, which in that process, I could not believe. But, but going back to PTSD, there is, do I have this? What does that mean? How is that possible? And if I come forward to even begin to ask for help, what does that do? for me in the rest of my life. Those are real concerns. I had them. I had an opportunity when a chief who noticed things because I couldn't hide, it was spilling out. You can't hide 20 pounds of weight loss and other behaviors that didn't seem consistent, but still highly functioning. Always, always taking care of the crew first. That was the best distraction I had. And then at home, be busy, 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 busy. More on the plate. Can't stop for one second to sit with what's going on in your head that you deep down know. You deep down know. And and this is I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sorry, Doc, but I wanna I wanna share an example. When I was talking and helping some extended family and friend fam, excuse me, extended family and friends, my best friends, in-laws, his parents with a, a nephew who was struggling with substance abuse and some other mental health disorders. Now, forgive me, but this older woman, you know, from a generation, she's in her 60s, incredible human being, could not, could not understand, put the bottle down. She could not understand addiction, didn't believe in it. And so we had a great conversation We've been talking and I said, okay, I'm gonna go somewhere I don't normally wanna go to make a comparison. You don't understand PTSD. You don't understand addiction. And, and, and you're questioning it's, it's, its realness. You know, this is a problem we have. Just, I don't get it. You don't have to get it, but let me do a comparative for you to this particular mom. And that comparative was she's overweight. And I said, here's something I don't understand. And forgive me, but this, is, this can touch people. Truth hurts. And I didn't like my own truth. I still don't. I still struggle with my own truth that I, I hear my voice all the time. Ah, hypocrite. Ah, that's not true. But it's a good critic. We have a good relationship now. Um, but I had to bring that up that I don't understand how someone could be heavy and, and, and not lose weight. And, and she went, whoa, this got personal. Are you talking about me? I said, I didn't say anything. I simply said, I don't understand how anyone could be overweight. Now, I'm a trainer. Of course, I understand that. There's a lot at play. 
but it's also taking responsibility for our own health, mentally, physically, spiritually, or, or all the areas of your life that are you. So for me, those are my big three. And I was all physical, very little mental, and a lot of spiritual. So her face turned red. I knew what I had done. It was not what I wanted to do to turn the attention onto you, a physical thing. They're, they're hardly comparable, but the point was this. I could eat a cake and not gain weight is what I told her. My sister, same mom and dad, my sister, blood sister, could think about the cake, look at it, whiff it, and gain five pounds. How is that fair, mm -hmm. right? So it's not a matter of fair, it's a matter of what is. It's our thought towards things, it's our genetics, it's our lifestyle, it's a combination of so many things. So when she says, put the bottle down for crying out loud, I don't get it. I, my response is put the fork down, I don't get it. So they're, they're both completely ignorant is the point and they're wrong and we need to understand. We need to ask better questions instead of saying, I don't get it. And, and sometimes putting up a wall, I did. So I'm a guilty of this. So that, that unfortunately is a rude way or a truthful way of waking people up to, okay, I'm open to now clicking on my, my other part of my brain to understand something that I don't. We need to, we need to understand it physiologically. We need to understand that person's background. And in the three conversations I've had in the last week, what I've realized with, with public safety members is they all have, no, 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 this is not everyone, but these three and myself all have childhood issues. And, and it's amazing when these guys, these hardened warriors and, um, and they're, they're gentlemen, I haven't talked to a whole lot of females um, in, in the fire service, many females, but not in the fire service that I, that I, that I am personally helping or talking to. Um, so these guys, it's 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 uh <laughs> it's just a mind-blowing experience so yeah that, that you go wow i had to peel back these layers and things i didn't want to really address and i have childhood issues that i'm working through and it's really helping so it's how deep do you want to go and that's for some with with forms of ptsd but that's the point is there is a complex series of events Okay, we call it complex post-traumatic stress injury disorder, but really the C means yikes. There's a series, there's events, there's a life, there's a, um, a lifestyle, and this is where you obviously in a way know more. So for some, like myself, I thought it was one bad call. Um, and where I'm going with this is it's the perception, the idea, and the misunderstanding, and frankly, my own ignorance of what I decided before I knew PTSD was, what I decided depression was, lack of motivation, lack of discipline. You know, unfortunately, we have a lot of people who self-defend themselves or are, are insecure like me who would say those things. Because when you're achieving and, you know, running up and I'm hiding my alcoholism, of course I can say those things because I have secrets to hide. I have a lot of insecurities and I need my armor on my outside shining as bright as it can. But truly, I would walk away not understanding these things. So to me, it was a death sentence. To me, there, it was unrecoverable. And they, these are frankly just not true statements. Um, and as I dug into to my own post-traumatic, it took me almost a year to come to terms with it where I could really begin to heal. So for me, I was aware. I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't acknowledge it with my counselor. I wouldn't look it up. I wouldn't look into it because when I did, when I did, I was reading an autobiography. I was reading something that was way too familiar. I was reading the signs that I had missed for 38 years. Um, because again, my ignorance on PTSD was some flashbacks and nightmares. Huh? Okay. I don't, you know, but, and then over the years, I find myself obsessing with those calls. Where did I go wrong? And why do I still hear that guy's voice? I'll never get that taste out of my mouth. 
why want, why do I never want to be at work? Why am I pissed off? Why am I not sleeping? Why am I treating patients worse? And maybe I'm not, even when I was doing well. Why do I feel a constant feeling of guilt or, or shame or just the, the bigger incidents would come and all around you slows down. And for me, all the anxiety I was carrying, all the insecurity I was carrying funneled into this perfect not perfect, but such an amazing performance on these high stress, high critical incidents that now when I forget about an appointment or I lose my pen to write something, I'm stressing. And so I just look back and all of that was channeled and stored in my central nervous system. There was no decompression. It was a badge of honor. It was, let's go grab some lunch and completely forget about the two-year-old drowning that we just spent three hours on. Mm -hmm. um, there's ways to cope, but we need to, in public safety specifically, from my experience, from a leader, and a follower was, you know, kind of military, don't ask, don't tell. We don't talk about those things. And the way we coped for most, and 95% cope well, is we cope by humor, sick humor. You, you have to laugh. I think that laughter is tears. Um, and machismo and bravado and more you know more armor put on it's a badge of honor yeah i've had four codes in the last week we had two drownings last year you know it's like it's a badge of honor in a way it is in a way those are those are unique calls that everyone kind of gulps swallows and goes yeah how'd it go everything okay the whole tone and atmosphere changes so you know and i look at my Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Of, I just I went off. I apologize. No, 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 not at all. In, in, in a lot of ways, this is like constant engagement in battle and firefight, right? And so every firefight that you come back to your FOB, you feel, hey man, we made it. We're alive. Thank God, right? And so, but guess what? We're going out for deployment again tomorrow. Beyond, yeah, right beyond the wire. And so we head out again. And guess what? We engaged in a huge battle, came back. Wow, okay, we made it again. But each battle that happened, you lose a piece of yourself. You lose a mm. piece of, of something when you get out on every battle because maybe something didn't go exactly the way that you thought it would, right? Maybe, maybe somebody else has an advantage because of, uh, because of aerial view of, of your team and you get uh, ambushed, maybe, right? So, so many different things happen. And uh, you could definitely equate that to the fire service because you go out on calls that are very dynamic. And, mm. you know, I, mean, I, I remember responding to a 962 uh, to a traffic accident on a highway here on the I-17 uh, with fire crew. And uh, we came off the truck and this is really basic, but I was observing so many things because I could, because I'm not, you know, uh, actively, well, I shouldn't say I wasn't actively involved, but I'll tell you that piece of it. But um, little things like traffic, for instance, so the fire truck is positioned across the I-17. You and I know that's a really busy highway, right? And mm -hmm. this is headed northbound in rush hour. Go figure. Oh. It's always the, always the worst time. And yeah. so my truck is trying to block traffic, but people rubber neck, people come around and they're trying to encroach on the scene. But here on the scene, you have a man who had a seizure who crashed his truck and the wife is in, in the front seat and then his son is in the back seat. And there's a lot of dynamic stuff going on, of course. And this is how quick things go, right? I, I was asked to do something and I, I grabbed a door and I didn't realize that the door had blood on it. Well, I had on no gloves, right? Silly things like that. And you know better. It's like, you know, you, you're so quick in action of what you do to try to take care of things that you end up making silly mistakes. 
And, and those little things, each time you go out to battle and you do something else, and my part was minor compared to what was going on, right? Um, it, it starts, you start to think about it afterwards and you start to remember, you know, a certain spot. I, I couldn't tell you exactly which exit that happened on the highway now because it, it was just one of many stories. Yeah. But every, every so often you get these blocks, you get these spots on highways, you get these uh, corners of things, you get locations of places you've gone to, right? I see your smile, but that's how you classify a city is, is yeah. by things that happen. So I want to turn that back over to you again, because I, I, I see that, that that struck a chord. So tell me about that. No, you, you really, you're really good. You can take what I rambled on in 10 minutes and condense into a, a well said one minute articulation. So, you know, one thing that I did talk and share with with my wife over the years were details. Um, not not details to upset her, or bring her into that, but to better understand why someone might suffer from PTSD. Everything you just said. And so we have great TV shows and great movies that glorify police and fire. And they're good looking, they're smart, they save the day. If they don't, it was, you know, something great turns out at the end. It's Hollywood. What they're, what they're not showing you is that it's your it's 17th call in two days. What they're not showing you is that when you pull onto that scene of a neighborhood that you would drive into and drop your kids off, uh, off or pick up and feel safe walking, it doesn't matter. You, you, you drive into a neighborhood at a house on any other day might have kids out playing. And what greets you is a cop running out, screaming to get in here and then runs back in the house. You don't forget that, that look on the, 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 the call for help. Um, you know, I don't know why, and I'm, I'm, I, I really feel um, I'm in a good place, Doc, but I get emotional when I talk about, you know, the people involved, I apologize. I think about that cop a lot. Um, we stayed in touch for years. He sent some letters to the department and city for, you know, the amazing work we did. He was, he was, uh, you know, he was, he was by himself on a really bad call. And parents were, um, you know, I want to bring you guys into this because it's the details. It's not just witnessing or going, it didn't go my way. And why do I have PTSD or later on? Because you, you know, again, like you said, doc, you clear these things and you're off and running. You have no time to process. So that, that cop, that cop just responded to maybe, uh, I think it was an unconscious or not even just a respiratory difficulty on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, um, I don't know, a year old, nine month old, I don't even recall. But, you know, we showed up and, and it's, it's not the kid, it's not the baby, it's the parents grabbing you and, you know, it, it looking at you and, and, and maybe not screaming, but begging you to save, your, save their kid's life. The same thing that I would do as a father, the same thing I would expect a mom to do. But then it's also this, the looks on the face of my crew. And as a captain, you know, that's really probably when I started to unravel because I guarded and protected my guys so much. I saw the problems we had in the fire service. And I said, this is my franchise, my crew and station. I took so much pride in uh, <laughs> you know, I was good. I don't really talk highly about myself a lot, something I've gotten better at over the years. I'll share my stories and always make myself a non-participant or a fly on the wall, but I'm really proud of uh, the, the way I conducted myself as a captain. 
and uh, anyone who's ever worked with me would say the same. So in doing that, I remember that crew, we had a senior uh, engineer, been on for about 19 years, medic, who was charting. I was skills and my best friend at the time, I mean, still best firefighter partner of all time, uh, still a dear friend, just looked at me with that look on their face. You know, that's what I don't forget in the look of, come on, Nick, you got to, you know, do something and, and froze. And my other medic partner was just, uh, I, I, I don't know if it was too much, too much um, family and screaming and chaos. I just dropped everything. We went to work um, and it was Adam and I and another EMT. I don't even recall. I don't remember them even being there. I do remember the, the engineer in their face and they froze. Um, you know, I think in that moment trying to process, get info and listen to screaming and, and, and be another senior medic to assist your captain medic who's on the ground performing, you know, attempting to innovate. And, um, you know, folks, it's, it's, we got to share this stuff. It's not something I haven't really done in detail on YouTube and on my own social media platforms, but it's not just, oh, you, you went on a suicide or you had a couple bad calls. It's the details and no Hollywood movie, no story time telling to bring you into the colors, the blurriness, the sounds, what you thought of yourself, what you did after, and so as a parent, I couldn't understand how I just was, I struggled after, after the fact, like why? Just philosophically doc with, with life. And I know everybody does. Every firefighter police officer has done this. Religious, atheist, deep or shallow. You're kind of like, huh. And you don't want to spend time thinking about it. It's depressing. So you move on. You give it to faith, you make your life better, you try to do something better. And that cop sent some letters, it was very nice. And I just said, you know, it's what we do, did our best and I was, didn't go our way. But I haven't once forgot, I could barely tell you what that little baby looked like or any details of the baby because it was a doll to me. Mm -hmm. It was just a doll. And I could tell you everything about the dad, that cop, the aunt, the mom, the health, the other worker that was there, everything about the firefighters. And, you know, anyway, man, it's just, it's intense. And we were there and I realized as a captain medic, we had to get out of that scene. Uh, did what I could. We scooped him and ran into the, as soon as the ambulance got there, which was a few long minutes behind us. So you wrap up a call like that. I'm in the ER. They continue to work this baby for an hour. And I just watched the mom and dad and I stared at them for that entire hour in the ER. I didn't leave. I was in the back room and I just stared at them hugging and, uh, um, grieving you know when i don't know why i did that because i could not understand why my babies were still alive and healthy and doing well and i had it all and i was just a part of someone's worst day and i couldn't save that baby um and this is when your internal dialogue is so important that you're paying attention to your unconscious thoughts Unfortunately, 95% of our thoughts are unconscious and you don't hear the, you know, yep, your dad was right. You suck, you know, or you're not quite the medic you thought you were. Or maybe if you were charting, Rick, uh, you know, the engineer could have, could have saved him. He couldn't get the innovation that, and, and it just goes on and uh, it goes on and, and forgive me for crying. I'm not, uh, you know, it's just a memory. I, not just a memory, but I, I've processed this call. It's, uh, but it's real. It's real and it stays with you for life. And 
you know, I think about those parents. I don't think about the baby. I think about the family all the time. That's what, so when someone goes, oh, did kid calls mess you up? It's how I thought of myself regarding those kid calls. It was my emotional, empathetic, uh, in, uh, my empathy. Sympathy is good. You got to guard your empathy. I was too empathetic with parents and family members and uh, gave too much of myself. And, you know, you said you, you walk away, you're never the same. But I cut a piece of my heart out and gave it to them. You know, and, um, so there's <clears throat> each one of us come in with our unique experience in, in our life. And I came in on fire and motivated, but you know, I was a scared kid inside and I was guarding that. And I, I played GI Joe and I played it so well that I convinced myself that I am all these things. And I had to prove it to everyone. Um, remember when you're walking around with a tattoo on your right arm, you're physically fit is it's, it's, it's humanly possible for a dad. And it says USMC and everybody knows you as a special forces Marine. Uh, that's something I put on myself. I know Nick's a second generation. These are my internal thoughts, of course, but it felt good. It felt good to get, to get that pat on the, not a pat on the back, but a, dude, tell, tell the guys that one time when you did that, you know, I mean, you're reliving high school war stories like uncle rico uh, at 40 talking about high school football days but but it yeah I was like, oh yeah i did that and um every memory that i had in initially in counseling and i i see firefighters walking around with this is every the, the cynical bitter nature that we develop and and police and fire it's true you always go why are these cops buttholes or that firefighters a dick excuse my language folks um <laughs> just think about their day at work. They didn't sell insurance. That's stressful. They didn't, they didn't do a lot of things. I used to think, why am I not a mechanic towards the end? Why did I not do the easy road and go into finance like you were? Why am I not doing real estate like everyone else? Why, when I go to work for 24 hours, I come home, I feel like I just lost a year of my life. You know? Um, so my approach was to do more because I knew what was going on in my head and my thoughts. So I, externally, I did more. And I always say, I always caution people, the overachievers, the high, high, um, high performing, performing, I'm like, just, just watch out, you know, watch out, be careful. There's a pace. And, and, and if you're, you know, pedal to the metal, it it can hurt you. So. Well, you know, I, what I would like to do, Nick, is I want us to. Um, sorry to, about that. But no, no, please never apologize. You are, you're phenomenal. And the way that you present this stuff is amazing. Um, I want us to, to talk about how guys that have similar struggles can overcome these these intrusive memories, these intrusive thoughts. And I know you don't have it all figured out yet, you know, and none of us do, but but tips and tricks that maybe have helped you to be able to get through that. 